Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day, and God, I just thank you for your word, and God, I thank you for Wednesday night church, and I thank you for the faithful ones who come. Lord, I pray that tonight you would just illuminate scripture to us, and God, if there's just one thought, one uh, prompting of the Holy Spirit, uh, God, I pray that we would listen, and God, I pray that we would obey. God, we just thank you for just what you're doing in our church, and God, it's just so so good. Uh, we just come out of Thanksgiving and then just to go right into Christmas. What a beautiful thing. So God, bless our Bible study tonight and our prayer meeting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 16 with me. Acts chapter 16. I want to talk to you tonight about attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. And I have three points tonight uh, as normal. Number one, Paul and Silas were being persecuted. Paul and Silas were being persecuted. Number two, Paul and Silas were praying and singing. Paul and Silas were persecuted, and they were praying and singing. And number three, Paul and Silas were ministering in Jesus' name. You know, I believe with all my heart, that Christians should be the most positive people on earth. If you think about all that we have and, you know, who, who uh, we belong to, and you think about, you know, we don't have to worry about death. Uh, you think about going to heaven, and, uh, you know, he leaves us here uh, for a reason, and that reason is ministry. And uh, while we're not all called to be ministers, we are all called to ministry, and that is uh, in the world in which we live. Because you can reach people that I'll never meet. Uh, you can reach people that uh, God has assigned to you, and God has said, you know, hey, you need to say something to this person. And what I'm trying to say is we have influence on people around us. And so we need to be about our Father's business. And I just love this scripture. I love their attitude. look in life one's way of thinking are we uh did i hit something is it working the mic's working okay all right let me give that again attitude is one's way of thinking or one's outlook on life and basically there's two uh two ways this can be seen number one you can have a negative attitude or you can have a positive attitude and you have to realize attitude is a choice. I mean, you can get up one day and you look and your tire's flat, flatter than a pancake, all right? And you get out there and if you start your day off like that, a lot, a lot of things with that negative thinking. And folks, I believe we as Christians need to get out of the negative mode that a lot of people live in. A lot of people, they, I mean, people that you're around, you know, and I, I had a church member last week, I asked how they were doing, and they said, oh, I'm just treading water. Of course, that's what I, that's what I say, you know, and that's, what, that's the responses I'd get. So they were quoting me in what I'm saying. And folks, I don't care how bad your day is, someone is in a worse situation than you. Okay, so we need to look at the positive things in life. And I'm not just talking about positive thinking. I'm talking about positive attitude. Okay, and that, that is a, a, a huge thing in our lives. Let's look at Acts 16, verse 16. Paul and Silas were being persecuted. Now it happened as they went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divina divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. And we know when it talks about the spirit, that kind of spirit, uh, it was demonic, okay? There were demons. Uh, probably with this, uh, she was possessed by a demon. Verse 17, this girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim, uh, proclaim to us the way of salvation. 
Now, if you look at that at face value, you think, well, she's doing a good thing. But folks, the problem with that is those people around her knew who she was and what she was about. So you can say the right thing, but, but that doesn't mean, you know, there's false prophets. Uh, and, and again here, there was definitely uh, a negative influence on uh, her and what she was saying. And this she did for many days. Because some people read this and just think, you know, Paul's a little impatient with her. So this has been going on for days and days. And there are even times, I'm just telling you, you can pray and you can pray and you can pray. And it seems like God is doing nothing. But folks, you have to understand God has a purpose in everything he does. The word here that we need to use is the word patient. Okay, when we don't, even when we don't think God is doing something, I promise you, he's doing something. But Paul, greatly annoyed. Now, they could have just said annoyed, but they used the emphasis greatly annoyed. He'd had enough. Turn and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of here. And uh, you know, Jesus himself uh, cast out demons and he gave uh, the apostles, you know, uh, you know, they, that, that gift that he had. And it says, and he came out at that very hour. So the thing that was driving her, the thing that, you know, that she was just going over and over and over it uh, came out, the, the demon. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And again, when it talked about seized, you know, uh, you know, it's, it, you could say the word arrested there. Okay, they wanted something done to Paul and Silas because of what was going on. And uh, the authorities there are local authorities, verse 20, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. And notice what they were talking about first, you know, they were talking about their race, you know, who they were. Okay, and they pointed out they were Jews. And of course there was the, you know, the city was under Roman law. Okay, so they had a right to do what they did. But again, we'll, we'll talk about that here in just a minute. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to observe, to receive and observe. And again, you know, you know, at that time, you know, they were teaching about Jesus. But listen, folks, he was, you know, Paul and Silas wasn't making them do anything. Okay. They were just preaching Christ. And, and again, you know, the gospel does offend some people, but that doesn't mean because we offend someone. And again, you don't, you know, you don't just need to badger people and badger people and, you know, tell them, you know, they're, you know, you're going to hell, you know, type stuff. But yet the truth is the truth. And, and they were preaching the truth from the gospel. Verse 22, then the multitude rose up against them. So it started out as one person, the master, turned into magistrates, which are more. And now almost like a mob uh, was after them and against them. And the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And I'm having a problem here with this due process of law here, okay? They just took things into their own hands. There was not a trial. Uh, you know, they, again, I, you know, we use the word lawyered up and things like that. But what they did was wrong. And, and, and automatically they said they were guilty. And when they had laid many stripes on them, and again, they did not know whether they were Roman citizens or not, which that would come up uh, later in the story. But not knowing that, it probably would have been 39 stripes. Threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. 
So they went from preaching the gospel to jail in probably, uh, you know, a half of an afternoon or less. Okay, they were in jail and they were not only in jail, uh, they were put in the inner prison. Uh, and that's, you know, I don't know, we, we would call it, you know, some kind of security thing there where they couldn't easily get out. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Hold your finger there and go with me to 2 Timothy 3. And this is Paul talking later on. 2 Timothy 3.10. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, and persecutions and afflictions. And again, I don't think Paul is bragging here. Okay, he was just trying to tell the folks and telling Timothy specifically, who was, you know, uh, his mentor, Paul's mentor. And, and, and Paul kind of even called him his son, even though it wasn't a biological son, it would have been a son in the ministry. He's not bragging on what he went through. He's simply saying, these things have happened to me. And, and the word persecution there is the one I want you to see, and afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecution I endured. And out of them, all the Lord delivered me. Folks, I'm telling you, God protected Paul and he allowed him, uh, Phil, you were telling all that he went through and none of us will ever go through that in our own lives. But he is simply teaching that you're going to be persecuted. And the reason they were being persecuted because they were living the Christian life. So we should not be surprised when someone gets mad at us. We should not be so surprised when someone gets upset at us. All right? Because if you live a godly life, that's, that's what the next, that's, that's what this verse is saying. Verse 12, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If you're living for Christ, it's going to happen. Okay, and we can't wear our feelings on our sleeves. We can't because even even Satan uses this. Okay, he uses the fear tactic at us, and and we need to be bold in what we are saying and what we are doing. Okay, and and he said, listen, the closer you get to Christ, the more you're going to offend the world is basically what he's saying. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Folks, the world in which we live in, I've heard this phrase just lately, it couldn't get any worse. And you know what I want to tell them? You haven't read Revelation, okay? It's going to get bad. Folks, it's bad now, but it's going to get worse, and we need to prepare ourselves spiritually. Folks, what we're talking about with Paul and Silas, uh, we're talking about spiritual warfare. Every day of my life, I have spiritual warfare in my life. There is not a day that doesn't go by that I don't sense the presence. And again, it's not Satan. It's demonic things. But he's after those. And I'm not saying I live such a godly life. I'm saying I'm a big target because I'm a pastor, because I'm preaching the word, because I will not compromise. I will not back down. Okay, so the closer you get, the more you're going to be persecuted. And I've seen, I've seen Christians go the other way. When they get, you know, in this rim and, man, they, they get real uncomfortable with it, they just shut down. Okay, they just quit talking. And again, I'm not talking, you know, just, just being loud and being obnoxious and things like that. But folks, the truth is the truth. So he says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned, being assured of, knowing from who you have learned them, that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith, which is in God. So what is it saying? Man, you need to know the Bible. You need to have some scripture in your head. You need to be able to say, you need to be able to, you know, not necessarily debate, but say, here's what the Word of God says. And not just quoting Scripture, you need to quote the reference also. 
okay, so that they can go look it up. And I'm telling you, some of them will. They'll see if what you're saying is the right thing. So how do we battle Satan? We do it with Scripture. He hates Scripture. He doesn't want to hear. He doesn't like Jesus' name. Folks, I've been in some situations and there were things going on and I'm saying to myself, Jesus, 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 I need you, Jesus. I've been in situations where I felt such a heavy oppression, okay? I wasn't scared, but I knew it was heavy. And you, ha the, the, you have to use Jesus' name and you have to use scripture. So Paul and Silas were persecuted. The second thing, back in our text, But at midnight, Paul and Silas, verse 25, were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Man, don't, don't you like that? You know, Paul and Silas could have been sitting there just saying, woe is me. Man, all we were doing is trying to preach the word of God. All we was trying to do is lead people to Christ, and this is what we get for it. All right. And, and folks, I am telling you, Paul and Silas had the right attitude. He had the right attitude. But at midnight, which is very, very late, they were praying and singing. Why? They had been beaten with rods, folks. They probably couldn't sleep for, you know, laying or sitting where they had been beaten. But instead of whining and griping and talking and, and, and doing the things that a lot of people do, they were praying. Folks, you cannot pray too much. I've never met a person, I have never met one, and after I talk to them, you know, I think you're praying too much. I've never met a person like that. Okay, most of us, and I'm including in us, don't pray, I'm including me, don't pray enough. So what's, what are they doing? They're praying. Okay, and you know what I think they were praying? God, give us opportunity. Give us opportunity. Even in this situation, give us opportunity. And then singing hymns to God. Man, there's just something about singing hymns in the middle of the night or singing hymns. And I've done it many a time. I do one of two things. I sing them in my head or I flick on and, and I still got a, a Walkman that's probably 25 years old. And I, I, I use the radio on that Walkman and I, I tune it into a K Love. And there has been many a night, especially when I was sick and there's just this battle going on, you know, in my head and, and physically and, uh, you know, spiritual warfare going on. And I'd hear a song. I remember one night I heard, I'll praise you in the storm. I'll praise you in the store. And there's other nights, uh, Rescue Me was another one I can remember. And there were literally times in the middle of the night, tears were falling from my face because that song meant so much to me. And God sent that song in the timing of the song. So they were praying and they were singing hymns. And this is the key. And prisoners were listening to them. Folks, People watch you all the time. They're seeing how you react to things, okay? And it's not when you're in a crowd how you react is the key. It's when you're one-on-one -on -one with something or even, even when you're by yourself. Folks, people are watching. They watch what your actions, and you can tell when somebody's upset or mad. Okay, people try to hide their attitude, but I'm just telling you, most people can't hide it. You can tell uh, they're kind of ticked off about that. And they were listening to them. And what was that? It was a ministry opportunity. Okay. They were literally uh, having church in the prison. And it says, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prisons were shaking. An earthquake. That was a coincidence, wasn't it? Not even close, folks. I do not believe in luck. I do not believe in coincidence. That was a divine appointment for Paul and Silas. You served me. They persecuted you. 
I'm going to give you the floor. I'm going to get you out of this prison. I'm going to take care of you. And it says, and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loose. Notice this. First thing I thought, and I've, I've studied this and looked at it, why didn't he just do Paul and Silas's? They were the ones. I mean, the other ones in the prison, they probably were there for a, a reason. Okay? But what was the bigger miracle? What was God trying to get at? The salvation of many souls. Okay? And so everybody's chains fell off. And in my mind, I was thinking about that time, everybody would be hitting the doors and seeing how fast we can get out of there. But if, as you read, look what it says. And, and the keeper of the prison awakened from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Do you realize they not only saved a jailer's whole family, they saved his life. Because the Roman law was that if one prisoner escaped from prison, your life would be taken from that. And instead of going and being executed in front of everybody, he thought, man, I'm just going to kill myself and get it over with because I know what's going to happen. And then it says, but Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Man, you talk about a testimony. You talk about having influence. You talk about a man doing the right thing. Folks, it's never wrong to do the right thing. And there are times for, you know, and I'm talking business things in relationships. We could just go on and on. We as Christians need to do the right thing. And my question is, why didn't those prisoners run? Because Paul and Silas didn't run. They stayed there. They trusted God. They believed that there was a bigger purpose going on in our lives. And again, you know, about the beating. Phil, I love what you said the other night, said Sunday night. And this happens to me all the time, all the time. Why? 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 And you had such great insight on that. Instead of asking why, ask how. How can God get glory in this situation? And folks, I'm telling you, we can make a difference in people's lives by our actions and by our words. Your normal group would have ran out of that prison and said, God did it for me, but not one. That, I mean, you look at that alone, that just blows my mind that nobody ran. But I believe it was because of the worship service that they were in. And I believe that they were looking at Paul and Silas and just thinking, man, there's something different about these guys. If they didn't run, I'm not going to run either. Folks, I cannot tell you how much influence. You influence people that you don't even know you influence. When I went back to Lawton and I saw youth that I had not seen in almost 30, well over 30 years. Two or three of them just came up to me and just said, Brother Mike, you just, you just, you'll never understand. I was young, I was dumb, I made some big mistakes, but they just said, it got to where as I got older, they would say, what, what, what did I learn? What did Brother Mike teach me? And folks, I'm telling you, we influence people that we don't even know that we influence. It could be a boss at work, okay? It could be a family member. It could be in a situation it, just like this, but it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, and that's what we do, folks. We have to look for the good in things. Too many people nowadays, they focus on the negative. Too many people focus on what they don't have. When you think about what we do have, folks, 
We are blessed. First Thessalonians 5. First Thessalonians 5. Look at verse 16. Rejoice always. All right. Folks, you, you, you have something to smile about. You have something to rejoice about. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Okay, we're talking about attitudes here. Okay, we need an attitude of rejoicing. We need an attitude of prayer. In everything, give thanks. Thank God for the little things. The little things. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Verse 19, do not quench the spirit. We must walk in the spirit, folks. We must be led by the spirit. We must be filled with the spirit to have the right attitude. Do not despise prophecy. Folks, that's preaching. That's the word of God. And do you know why lots of people don't want to go to church? Because they don't want to be convicted about their sin. So if I don't go, I don't have to deal with it. But folks, if they see Jesus in us, if they see that abundant life, that, that positive attitude, that looking for the good in things, if they see you encouraging someone or you going the extra mile uh, for someone, I believe it'll influence them also. Verse 21, test all things. Just like Paul and Silas, man, I'm just telling you, it was a spiritual warfare. You need to be, you need to be able to identify spiritual warfare, folks, and abstain from every form of evil. And that really is my life verse. I, 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 I really like that. And, and let me paraphrase it. When in doubt, do without. If I think I'm going to make somebody stumble, if I think it may, may make Christianity, any, any mark on Christianity, then I'm not going to do it, folks. I'm going to abstain. In verse 23, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. What is everybody looking for? You think about it in life. They want peace. And folks, first you have to know the Prince of Peace to have peace. Okay? And then we as Christians need to be peacemakers. Okay? We need, and I know we can't fix everything, and I know we can't fix some people's attitude. But we don't have to get on their attitude train is what I'm saying. You make a difference. You influence people around you. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is all of you. He just said everything about you. Your whole being. Again, we're not perfect. Yes, we mess up. And by the way, when we mess up publicly, we need to tell them publicly that we messed up. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. Folks, I'm telling you, if we would do that, if we would practice that it, as Christians, I'm telling you, uh, we, we would influence people. We, we could change a mindset and change an attitude. He who calls you is faithful and who also will do it. And I've heard people say, well, I just can't do it. I, you know, I can't be nice all the time, but why not? Okay. Jesus, again, I know he was firm when he needed to be firm. I know he defended the faith. I know, you know, he, he was called a lot of names, but folks, I'm just telling you, we need to do the right thing every time. Now look at verse 29, Paul and Silas were persecuted. Paul and Silas were praying and singing. And folks, the other thing, attitudes will always influence your actions. Attitudes will always influence your actions, and we need to remember that. Paul and Silas are still ministering. Then he called for a light and ran in, and this is, this is the jailer, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. I want to ask you now, 
who was in control. All right. Well, some of you would say Paul and Silas, but I say it was God that was in control. God brought this jailer to his knees. Why? He just had a life changing experience because of the way Paul and Silas in their actions and their words and nobody leaving the place. Because folks, I am telling you, his boss would have put him to death in a heartbeat. And he, and, and their actions and their attitude saved this man's life. And it says, and, and he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, the question I have to ask, that, that's a question, but how would they know, how would he know this? Because Paul and Silas were not just singing. Okay, I believe there was a sermon mixed in there too. I believe Paul and Silas was preaching to everybody. And again, we look at preaching like up here I'm, and I'm doing that. But folks, our life preaches a sermon every day. Our lives preach a sermon. You say, well, I've never preached. Well, technically no, but spiritually, yes. People are listening to what we say. People are paying attention to what we do. And he asked the questions. And the reason I believe he asked that is because he heard bits and pieces of the gospel. And folks, again, you know, you, you know, there's different types of gospel presentations. Some are just sowing presentations. God gives you the chance just to share some scripture with you, uh, with someone and, and, and to just plant seeds in their life. All right. Every time you have a witnessing situation doesn't mean, you know, you, you, you press them. Okay. But I'm saying someone else will pick it up and you'll have another opportunity. And I believe that's what was going on here. He heard partial gospel. He knew something was different about these two. Folks, I truly believe when we walk into a room within five minutes, somebody should know that we're a Christian or we're not. We, they should. They should sense there's something different about us. Verse 31. So, so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Man, don't you like that? He didn't say, you know, if you have enough faith, you might be saved. He said, believe in Jesus Christ. Folks, that is a gospel presentation. Jesus is all over the Bible. Jesus had lived. Jesus, and who, not, who, who doesn't know? I mean, we don't know. This guy could have been present at the crucifixions of Jesus for all we know. He was a Roman soldier. So he's seen a lot of that. And, and so believe on Christ. They tell, tell them that. And it says, you will be saved, you and your household. And again, some people take this out of context that since this got saved, it was a blanket thing. Now, folks, it's an individual a decision that each of us have to make. And I, I'll never forget one night I was in Lawton and I had a, a family of five that visited our church and I went out to their house and the husband and wife were there and I got, I mean, halfway through a gospel presentation and one of the kids came in. So they said, wait, 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 would you start over? I, I, I want my son to hear this. And then about 20 minutes later, two of the other kids came in. They were all teenagers and that was the reason why I was out there because I was a youth minister. And so they come in and the parents go, wait, 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 could you, could you start over and, and do this again? And when all was said and done, all five of them accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I got to baptize them the very next Sunday. Folks, I am telling you, it is so important. Man, don't, I mean, when you see families that are saved, I mean, it's fine. One salvation, all of heaven rejoices. But when you see God change a whole family, I'm telling you, that's God, folks. That is God. 
verse 32, and then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that were in his house. Verse 33, and he took the same that hour of the night and washed their stripes. Why did he do that? Well, his mama probably taught him to do that. Well, I hope she did. <laughs> but what, was they, what did he realize? What they did to them were wrong. It was wrong. Okay, no, no due process of law. They didn't do anything wrong. They presented the gospel. This, this, this demonic lady just kept bugging them and bugging them and bugging them. Paul just said, you know, I've had enough. And folks, the only reason the owner did that was because he was going to lose money. Okay, his money-making deal was gone. But Paul was persistent. And Paul did the right thing. And this jailer washing their stripes, that I, I believe it was because of conviction also. Okay, he saw, they, the jailer saw how the Romans treated him. And he realized, man, this is wrong. There's no way they should have been thrown in jail. There's no way they should have been beaten. And I can do something about this. Folks, you would be amazed at what a kind word could change a conversation. You would be amazed at what caring for someone. And it doesn't always have to be monetary things. A handshake, a hug, a prayer, just stopping and praying for someone could mean so much to someone. And immediately, he and all of his family were baptized. I mean, you know, Paul and Silas, or Paul was probably just saying, okay, the next step is baptism. This jailer says, well, why, man, we, we got a trough out here. Can we do it right here? Kind of like the, the, the guy on the road. And they were baptized. Now, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced. He fed them. I'm sure they didn't get much in prison, maybe bread and water, but he was meeting their physical needs also. And he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Oh, folks, this is God, this is Jesus, and this is the Holy Spirit working on not only this Philippian jailer, but his whole family. You talk about a God moment. Wouldn't you like to have been there that night? Wouldn't you like to witness that baptism? That would have been awesome. Acts 20, and I close with this. Acts 20, verse 17. This is Paul talking to the uh, elders at Ephesus. And it says, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Again, he just sharing with them. And he was going back to these, these churches that he had started, and he was trying to encourage them in the faith. And here's what he was saying. The paraphrase is, I'm probably not going to be around here. I don't even know that I'll be back to this place. People are going to persecute you. People are going to say ugly things to you. People are going to, you know, uh, you know mock who, who you believe in, and, and they're going to try to discourage you. Folks, I'm telling you, we lived in a discouraged world. And do you know what? That phrase, misery, misery loves company, there is some truth to that, folks. But you don't have to go to their pity party. You don't have to go to their negative comments. Verse 20, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Paul just said, hey, man, I, I, it was in the open. It was public. I wasn't trying to hide things. We didn't have an underground church. We preached from the housetops, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, the only thing, the heartbeat of the Apostle Paul was evangelism. 
It was the gospel. And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, every city. What did he do? He preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. He preached it. The Holy Spirit was behind him, saying that chains and tribulations await me. Paul knew in his heart of hearts. I mean, his buddies and so many people tried to tell them, do not go there. Do not go. Do not go. But the Holy Spirit kept telling him to go. Look at verse 24. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. What is he saying? He said, they're not going to discourage me. I've read several times where Paul, when he was in, under house arrest, they would let people come in and out. Even though they, you know, he, he would have a guard there, okay? He would lead, <laughs> you know, that guard would be there for a while and he'd lead one of them to the Lord. And they would be sneak, they would be sneaking things in to Paul. Even in prison, I think this happened a few times. But, but even in that, folks, I am just telling you, no matter what situation Paul was in, here's what I'm trying to say. He shared the gospel and he shared the love of Christ with everyone around him. And folks, that's what God wants us to do. All right. Just be nice. Be positive. Get to a, get to a spiritual, uh, you know, conversation. Get to, hey man, God, God can save you. Jesus can help you. Use your testimony. Folks, if you're saved, you have a testimony and you can use that testimony uh, and you can be used by God to see someone saved. Folks, we don't save anyone. I've never saved anyone in my life. Okay. We're just the vessels. We're just the tools. We just lead people along the way. And folks, if you start doing this, I'm just telling you, there will probably be eventually persecution, but don't let it bother you. God is bigger, folks. God is bigger. And attitude is everything. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I know, really, sometimes I, I know I'm preaching to the choir on Wednesday night. But yet, God, I, I just pray that you would just uh, help us to understand attitude is so important. And, you know, really, negative attitudes just, they just pull you down. Uh, they just get you thinking the wrong way. Uh, they even depress you sometimes. And God, I pray that we would not have negative attitudes, but God, I pray that we would realize who we are, whose we are, what you have done for us. And God, I just pray that our attitude would be positive. And I pray, Lord, that people could tell that we are Christians. God, thank you for this wonderful example of Paul and Silas. I mean, very, very few people would have done what they did. But I thank you, Lord, the, that you have shown us this. And God, even, even dear Christmas, I've heard it pretty much all my life, some of the most depressing time of the years in December and Christmas. And God, I pray that we would be uh, just agents of joy. God, we'd be agents of encouragement. God, I pray, Lord, that we would just stop and, and pray for somebody when they said, man, I'm concerned about this or I'm concerned about that, that we would just stop and just ask them, can I, can I pray for you about that? And God, I know things will be better. So God, just help us to, to look for divine appointments, help us to realize the Christmas season is about Jesus. And God, where we can get our testimony in and the gospel in, I pray that we would do that also. God, just help us to have the right attitude in difficult times. God, your word shows it. It's not going to get better and better. But God, we have you with us. We have salvation. We have the promise of heaven. 
we have that you never leave us and you never forsake us. So God, I pray that we would dwell on these things, the positive things of the Christian life. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen.